Podcast. I'm Chris Tashew, and I am joined once again by two people who I am very happy are here to talk about black exploitation films and not depressing sci-fi movies. The host of the Projection Booth Podcast, Mr. Mike White. Batman, motherfucker. <laughs> Let's go get some McDonald's. <laughs> Yay, McDonald's! <laughs> I know, it's such a weird line. And the host, one of the hosts of the One Season Show, one of the hosts of the Scary Stories We Tell podcast, award-winning screenwriter, Jess Byard. Hello. That's a lot of introductions. That's more introductions than I probably deserve. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, what would my introduction be? <laughs> uh, local asshole slash crazy person. <laughs> So on this episode of the Culture Cast, we are here to talk about Black Belt Jones from 1974. Enter Jim Dragon Kelly. He clubbers them up as Black Belt Jones. I lost three of my best men in there. Now, I'm asking you as a favor. You're asking me to be the fourth. Get a couple tanks and blast it down. Forget it, man. I ain't going in there. It's a fortress. Well, fortress or no, it's top priority. (laughs) So am I. It's suicide. And dust to dust. Now, who killed my father? Who's Pinky? What you wanted for a little mama? I ain't your mama. What's wrong, man? Oh, Black Bell, she is good, man. She is bad. Boy, what are you talking about? Sydney. She went into the hip pocket. What? She's a fighter like us, man. It, it, it. She is bad. Who she's bad? Now, what are you doing? No, no, you stay here till I get back. Do those dishes or something. They're done. Black Belt Jones leads his private commandos into the nerve center of a gangland stronghold to crack a super crime conspiracy. Enter Jim Dragon Kelly. This is the movie that breaks through to a new dimension in film excitement as Kelly takes on the underworld. The film is directed by Robert Klaus. It is a screenplay by Oscar Williams based on a story by Fred Weintraub and Alexandra Rose. It stars Jim Kelly, no, not the Buffalo Bills quarterback Jim Kelly, African-American superstar Jim Kelly, Gloria Hendry, Scatman Crothers once again, thank God, with another wacky wig. That's that's (laughs) Scatman. And, uh, oh, there's a lot of folks in this movie. Uh... A lot of really amazing character actors, and I am super excited to talk about it. It is about a... Can we just call this movie what it is? Black Bruce Lee? (laughs) Yeah. I remember hearing somewhere a a tagline for this movie that I've never been able to prove, which is, Bruce Lee's back and this time he's black. I mean, (laughs) if that's not a real thing, which it seemingly isn't, holy shit. That's about as... Right? 
They, I mean, look, Robert Klaus, obviously, uh, don't get me started on Game of Death. Mother of God. Uh, that is one of the most bizarre attempts at making a film or finishing a film I've ever seen. But this is pretty much as, a, a, a pretty much what I would consider to be the best follow-up to Enter the Dragon. Because it's pretty much, like you said, Mike, Black Bruce Lee. Even down to the noises. <laughs> I mean, the amount of the noises, noises. That are, they're copped from Bruce Lee, like wholesale almost. Well, not even just the noises that Jim Kelly makes, but I love the Warner Brothers sound library of body falls. I just absolutely <laughs> love when a body falls and you hear that <clears throat> so- kind of noise. <laughs> All of the sound effects in this are just, you can just put it on as like comfort music, you know, not even talking about the score. I'm just talking about the sound effects. So, Mike, I ask you this every time you're on, especially if it's something that you helped curate, which you did. Why are we watching Black Belt Jones? Why did we watch Black Belt Jones? Because it's Black Belt Jones, motherfucker. It's so good. I love this movie. You were looking for fun black exploitation films, something that would redeem your earlier black exploitation month and i immediately thought of this because it is so much fun jim kelly maybe not the best actor in the world in this but he's definitely heads and shoulders above gloria hendry and my goodness just i love the way that this movie moves i love everything about it the God, just the opening credits. You could just play the opening credits and I would be happy. We could turn off the movie after that, but why would you? Because this movie, it's got everything. So Jess, had you seen this before? I had not. This uh, this had been one that's been on the list to see for a while. I don't I don't know why I hadn't seen it. it just hadn't crossed my radar yet. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I thought it was fun. Uh, I I don't love it as much as you do, Mike. I don't love it as much as uh, other black exploitation films uh, I've seen, including Coffee, which we watched for this podcast. Um, I think uh, it's not even the, it's not the acting or anything that really is what, you know, kind of takes me out of it. It's I, I, quite honestly, I, I do admit that I kind of have a blind spot when it comes to Bruce Lee and um, kind of certain martial arts movies. And I don't, I don't know, they're real hit and miss for me to where I, I am enjoying what I'm watching, but after a while, I just kind of get bored of watching the same thing. Uh, the last 10 minutes of this movie is a good example. <laughs> um, but no, I, I do agree. I'm glad I saw it. I, I think that this is probably... 1974 is pretty early. I think that uh, most of the black exploitation that I've seen probably fits in like the later 70s era and I think is a bit more punchy than I'm used to it, the, or than, you know, than <laughs> no fun intended. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I don't know. I, I do think that this movie moves, but I think that it does kind of get a little bit monotonous at times. Uh, and I was a little confused as to who the bad guys exactly were. <laughs> so <laughs> what their plan was specifically. Well, it's basically that whole, we're going to tear right? down the rec center. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's true. It, it is that like, you know, save the rec center, save the gym, save the roller rink type movie. Yeah. And somehow it ties into the mafia's plans. And I absolutely love this mafia in here that <laughs> they are so freaking cartoonish. And then when the one guy actually says mama Mia, I'm just like, wow, I expected <laughs> you to say mama Mia. I am very happy right now. I love the the one mobster who is consistently overdubbed through the entire movie. Everybody yeah. else is speaking with their normal voice, but that guy, his entire <laughs> that was his dialogue has been replaced. Yes, yes. Vincent Barney. Named after a town in Texas. Yeah. Well, and it's funny because I've been watching uh, during this quarantine, um, been watching a lot of TV and movies, obviously, so I decided to uh, finally watch The Sopranos because I had never actually watched it before in its entirety. So it, it's funny going from watching that, like, I mean, that's all I've been watching pretty much, and then straight into Black Belt Jones. <laughs> it's like if Tony Soprano and his crew were, you know, slightly more bumbling, 
couldn't be like this. <laughs> Slightly more bumbling, she says. Uh, wow. No one hey, ever some of threw them. panties at Tony Soprano. Soprano. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you have these? You don't need these. He's throwing panties at us. That's a, she's an interesting character. <laughs> so, I will say of the movies we've watched so far this month, this one is my least favorite so far. That's not saying much considering we've liked all of them. I think my issue with this film is what Jess mentioned already. It does feel a little monotonous. And it's nothing against Jim Kelly. It's nothing to do with Gloria Hendry or anyone else. But the conclusion of this film is... Ugh, I, it's a 10 minute fight in a car wash. Like. It's it's a 10 minute fight in a in a bubble pit. A soap bubble. But pit. without the car wash soundtrack. Yeah. It's <laughs> I mean, look, the, the climax of the film is not indicative of the film as a whole, but there's a lot of stuff in this film I did like. I, you know, I like a mm-hmm. lot of it. But I do feel like there's a lot of kung fu action pieces that don't work and aren't particularly interesting. Yeah, that's that's where I kind of fall, where I don't mind so much the, you know, I, I, martial arts movies are, you know, it's... A, it's primarily about the fighting that's what you're watching it for you're watching these actors who are are athletes and doing these things so i i am i am forgiving of story that's not you know super deep and complex uh but it just kind of felt it's funny to say this for a movie that's only 86 minutes long because it's not a long movie but it does feel like some of those fight sequences could be shaved down a bit in the editing room because like you said Chris I I don't know if it's maybe maybe it's you know not the right sound mix and not the right sound design to kind of make these fights more exciting but it did kind of feel like there's just something a little bit low energy after a while with some of the fights because it felt like we were seeing the same moves over and over and not really getting like that like real visceral you know contact just because of the you know the, this choreography is obviously it's not as good as bruce lee <laughs> well it's but, better than uh, game of death that's for sure but then again is anything better than bruce lee someone holding up a bruce lee cut out in front of their face in a mirror <laughs> <laughs> that's a terrible <laughs> that like game i've of, never seen that <laughs> game of death is just an atrocity of of filmmaking and it's i mean it's not completely robert klaus's fault but this film makes up for the disappointment that i felt towards that film because again like you said mike it is very bruce lee-esque but like jess said i think bruce lee did it better i think my uh, one Mm -hmm. of the other issues i have with this film again going back to the climax is you have this character of gloria hendry playing Sydney, who she's a badass in her own right and she gets she gets sidelined in the climax by just pushing guys into a dump truck like why 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 because she couldn't help black bell jones kick some ass i mean she is a badass character but she's not a badass character in the way that like coffee is a badass character well it's because coffee was the lead of her own film right yeah but she you know gloria hadry's character here is uh, a little i don't know counter counterintuitive to herself sometimes uh with her you know i don't she can take care of herself mentality, but she also, we have basically what amounts to a three minute scene or so of her saying like, well, if you want me, you're going to have to take it. And then him having to chase her down and, and tackle her and get, you know, that from her. And I, I get, you know, that's fun and playful and whatever, but it also, A, it just takes up too much time for me. It's too long. Uh and yeah, I don't know. I get weird mixed vibes from this character that I feel like kind of they didn't know what they really wanted to do with her in certain parts. And I think that kind of is to your point, Chris, where by the end of it, she's literally just standing by a dumb truck, kind of like half-assed helping throw some people in. <laughs> and that scene on the beach is bizarre. It feels like an interlude from another movie that isn't this one. Yeah. Her, co- it, it- <laughs> her cookie would kill him. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I feel very now, bad for the guy with the guitar and smashed. the guy who's selling. Yeah, and and the guy who's also selling balloons who gets them all popped. It's like who's going to mm-hmm. pay for all that? <laughs> Black Belt Jones. Yeah, it's like you're kind of a dick. And, and the other thing about this character of Black Belt Jones that I I, I think is also weighs against this film for me is. 
I don't find Jim Kelly's performance, and again, it's not his fault, because I've already watched three the hard way, but I don't find Black Belt Jones' character to be as charismatic as Isaac Hayes or Pam Greer. And with those strong leads in the last two films that we've watched, they're, they're so well-written, they're so charismatic, Every time they're on screen, they, they steal the scene. And then you come to Jim Kelly, and the writing in this film is not nearly as, like like you were mentioning, Jess, not as punched up. It's not as smart and clever. I mean, there are funny parts, and there are clever parts, and there are good one-liners, but it feels a shade less interesting than the last two films. It it feels more, I, I think, you know, l- this movie, I believe, is, is like, categorized as kind of like an action comedy. Uh, and for me, this is, yeah, th- this movie is not as funny as, you know, I was hoping or expecting it to be. And, uh, yeah, I think part of that is it's just, you know, A... Like we're saying, Isaac Hayes and Pam Greer are pretty much, they're, they're powerhouses of actors. So it, you know, might be somewhat unfair to compare, you know, Joe Kelly to them. But he, yeah, he's just a little bit bl- like, you know, wooden with his deliveries. And also a lot of the humor and kind of, I, I guess, you know, physical comedy, which I generally do like, feels really kind of cartoony, like Saturday morning cartoony. Which kind of makes it feel a little bit more kid friendly. Like this, this, you know, aside from the beach scene and a couple other scenes, this is probably your more like, you know, toned down black exploitation movie. Or that's not, there's not really, is there any nudity in this movie? I don't mm. quite remember. I don't. I mean, in coffee, it's like right there all the time. I mean, they yeah. do use the so, N word in this movie, but there is no nudity. Right, even though he has the army of kung fu girl assassins. Oh, well, you know what? I, we lied. There is nudity, and it's on the beach scene, and it's with the two people that run out of the tent, and you see That's their, right. their naked butts. But, but, but I, I don't know. Do you guys agree with me? I just, I feel like this movie is in comparison to other black exploitation films that we've watched this month and ones that I've seen in the past. This one feels a little bit more cartoony and lighthearted than other ones. And I think for me, I just don't, that's just not generally my kind of thing. So it makes sense that I didn't love this one as much. Where does this, I mean, because again, Mike, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, anytime you're on, because you're a font of film knowledge when it comes to a lot of <laughs> stuff. Jim Kelly is in a lot of other black exploitation films, correct? Yes. Where Where is this in his other films that you've seen? I mean, for me, this is at the top. So if you don't like this, you're probably not going to like too many other Jim Kelly films. I mean, do not ever get tempted to watch the sequel to this. <laughs> I've already it heard you talk about good. it. <laughs> not good. I mean, he's he can play a supporting character, I think, better than a lead character. So when he is in Enter the Dragon, or he is in... Uh, Three the Hard Way, I think you're doing okay. But I've seen, like, Death Dimension and a couple other films that he's been in, and I'm just like, eh, all right. You know, Golden Needles, that kind of stuff. He's okay. But for me, Black Belt Jones is where I like him the most. I kind of figured you were going to say that. I just... I like him in Three the Hard Way, and when we talk about that on the next episode, we'll we'll talk more about that and his interaction with... um, Fred Williamson and Jim Brown. And I think the thing is, is Jim Kelly is good. He's okay on his own, but when he's with other people and he can play off of them, because he's a straight man, like, in this film, is he not? Like, he totally is. Yeah, I would say so. I, I think having, uh, we, we talked a little bit offline as far as um, Alan Weeks, who was, who what was his name? Jerry in Truck Turner and... That I think the scenes where Jim Kelly and Alan Weeks are together are the better scenes in this because I think Alan, Alan Weeks is a really good actor, especially compared to Jim Kelly, but gives him something to work off of. Whereas when he's with Gloria Hendry, who is more of a martial artist than an actress, I think it's like, okay, this isn't necessarily working. But when you put him with you know, Papa Bird or, you know, the, the students there, Clanview, um, it's like, okay, 
th- this works, but yeah, on his own, maybe not so much. But I mean, there are certain scenes in this movie that I just absolutely love. The whole every three seconds scene. Um, I mean, anytime, anytime Pinky's on screen and how he has a thing against communists, it's it's wonderful. I honestly think that Malik Carter as Pinky steals the film for me. One hundred percent, he's the best part of the movie. His like villain is such a like. He's such a dickhead in the best... He's a dickhead in the best way. He's the way you want your villain to be in a film like this. Because you had Yafet Koto and yeah. Truck Turner, who's just a despicable bastard. And then in Coffee, you have the character... And I forget the actor's name, but he's the one who's on MASH. Alan Arbush? Something to that effect? Um, yes, Alan Arbush. Yeah, yep. he plays a despicable bastard, too. And it's a it's in a different direction than this film, but it's that same like this is the kind of character you want to root against. And Malik Carter in this film as Pinky is just great. He's like, I'm gonna teach you a lesson. You're gonna go to class, and he's about to you know hit the guy in the face with the cue ball. You know, I mean, he's a despicable bastard of a character who kills Scatman Crothers, and he's great. And with like the lightest punch in the world, yeah. Scatman Crothers <laughs> one punch away from dying. <laughs> Uh, which is, I mean, again, just <gasps> looks better than one axe chest, you know, that's true to the chest. I, I, I think Scatman in Scatman survived in truck Turner. So Scatman died in this movie, uh, pretty early on too. I was kind of surprised how quickly he, he ate it in this movie, but it, it seems to me that Jim Kelly is being outclassed by almost everybody else in this film. Uh, Again, I, yeah. I'm not blaming I th- him. I think part of it is the writing. No, yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I think a lot of it's the writing. It's just not a particular, you know, Mike, I, I don't think that what you absolutely love about this movie is the, you know, specifically the story. I think it's no. more, you know, yeah, it's more everything, you know, inside of the movie. And so I think that, yeah, it, this writing is pretty stiff and stale. Um, and having, you know, stronger, you know, supporting actors does kind of, you know, upstage Jim Kelly in a way. But I, that's not to say that he's not good. I think that he's just, he's not a comedic leading man in this for me. It just doesn't work. Well, look, I mean, he's a good looking dude. He's jacked. He's ripped. Mm-hmm. He's clearly athletic. And the, he, he fits the role, if that's what they were looking for, perfectly. Uh, again, I'm going to defer to resident black exploitation expert Mike White. How <coughs> many other kung fu... Kung fu, Jesus. How many other black exploitation kung fu films are there of value worth watching? Oh, gosh. Oh, okay. Well, you just saved me a, that's why a lot I, of... I, I wanted to get to all the way to the end first, because I wanted you to have to be <laughs> have like a very quick existential crisis that then you're saved from. <laughs> right. You know, I can't really think of that many. I mean, I think... That's kind of what I expected. I still haven't seen Bamboo Gods and Iron Men, which I've always heard was good, but... Yeah. Well, I mean, it was a thing for way. a while. Yeah. But I wouldn't even consider that like a... I'm talking like primarily like your main way of fighting is through Kung Fu. Right. Do you consider Dolomite a uh, Kung Fu? Well, there is that. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I would say at least two more. So Dolomite and the Human Tornado. Right. I love yeah. Dolomite. And probably the Disco Godfather, because I don't yep. remember him using a gun too often, but I do remember him throwing the one guy who's putting the bug in the phone over his shoulder and <laughs> saying, talk, talk, you motherfucker, talk. Some things I do like about... Who sent you? <laughs> who sent you? <laughs> I will tell you some things I do like as someone who is uh, dis- descended from, whose family is on one side... My maternal family is all uh, Italian. I do enjoy knowing that the black exploitation films were so hell bent on making the mafia the bad guys all the time, and they are just like you guys were t- mentioning earlier, caricatures of human beings, let alone Italians. Mamma mia, what the fuck is going on here? You know what's weird to me though. You know, I I always. I don't usually associate like mob being the the villains in black exploitation. I usually associate it with either being like law enforcement authority type or the uh, you know dealers on the street deal at the kids. Like that that's usually the dynamic at least in the in the in the movies that I'm familiar with in this uh 
subgenre. Well, I mean, in this film, I would have been less surprised if the character saying Mamma Mia didn't have fucking raviolis falling out of his mouth when he was saying it. <laughs> and an Italian chef making the A-OK sign in the background. It's it's weird. It works. We should really do a month of uh, Italian, like, giallo movies, Chris, because the actual Italians are... We were going are... <laughs> to at one point, and then we kind of lost sight of it. I know. We should do it again. I think we should do films... <laughs> Only Robert De Niro films. No. <laughs> Why not? I mean, he's in so many good movies. Uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein? <laughs> Analyze that. Analyze that, yeah. Meet the Fockers? Meet the Fockers? Bad Grandpa. Mm. Oh, there yeah, you go. That's like, is, that's like the nuclear option. <laughs> Bad Grandpa. Uh, I, 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 you know, the mafia in this film, they're, they're like beyond stereotypes into caricature. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fine. It's hilarious. I mean, I, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, Mel Novak as kind of the main bull haircut dome of hair sporting villain with his goofy ass hat. <laughs> Not Malcolm McDowell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's supposed to be intimidating, I bet. <laughs> yeah, but he just looks like Alex DeLarge. <laughs> but yeah. who is intimidating if I were to come across Alex DeLarge? I would not be very happy, but. Mel Novak, on the other hand, not so like much. Him. Uh, and I think no. so for much. me, my favorite gag throughout the entire movie is the complete abuse of Earl Jolly Brown <laughs> in, in like every scene that he's in. <laughs> he's getting kicked in the face. He's getting kicked in the nuts. He's getting thrown through and out of things. And then at the end, he just gets electrocuted and fucking dies. So <laughs> uh, Earl Jolly Brown, for those of you who do not know, plays Whisper in Live and Let Die. Probably his most famous role and also his first role, judging by his IMDb account. He was also in Truck Turner, but he was uncredited as oh, as overweight bar patron. Wow. I mostly know him from his fine work in Linda Lovelace for president. I've never seen that. It's not good. It is so not good. <laughs> is that just like a porno? No, no. It was uh, cashing in on her celebrity and... Uh, Oh, I was supposed to write about it a long time ago for this book, and I just I couldn't bring myself to watch it a second time. <laughs> it was so bad. Yeah, it, it, there's a a lot of quote unquote comedy <laughs> in that movie. <laughs> Boy, sounds like quote unquote comedy, huh? Boy, yeah. But you know, Scatman Crothers is in. Oh that my as well. God! What would that man not do for a Klondike bar? Jesus! Christ. <laughs> so Scatman Crothers, again, for those of you who don't watch black exploitation films, which correct that immediately, uh, will mm. know him as one character and one character only, which is Halloran, Dick Halloran from Scatman. Oh, okay. <laughs> or... I thought you meant. I I thought it was Kung, uh, Hong Kong Fui. <laughs> Hopefully he's in the scuba verse. Oh, yeah, probably, uh, what is it, archival footage. Okay. Uh, probably, who knows. Um, but The Shining is Dick Halloran. And it's just... It's, oh, it's, right. <laughs> right, that little movie. Um, that movie. I just, I love seeing him in these movies because it's just so unlike anything I've ever seen him in before. He's great. He's hilarious. I'll slap the black off of you. <laughs> that, woman. that woman. Oh, my God. <laughs> I wanted a movie with her. Like I, just, I would have just hung out in that house for a while. <laughs> but to Jess's oh, to Lord. Jess's point, I did kind of have a hard time figuring out like the like the villains and the plots, like machinations, because like it just seemed like there were multiple villains. I mean, because there was the mafia, and then obviously there's. The, the other guy who's involved with the mafia. And that's generally what it is. It's just kind of all of the bad guys are tied together. But but yeah, yeah. it didn't it didn't seem like it mattered all that much. <laughs> and the Italians are using the blacks as muscle against the whites. What was, it, what right. was he called the ones from San Francisco? Bogarts. Bogarts. Couple of Bogarts. The goofiest looking assholes yes. from Central Casting. Including a guy with a vaguely Jamaican accent, but it was better than coffee's Jamaican accent. Hey, man, let me tell you something, <laughs> man. Uh, yeah, well, coffee's better to look at. That's, 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 that's true. true. <laughs> uh, according to IMDb, it's all about her, quote, big boobies, unquote. Thanks to you, IMDb. Wow. Commenter. Thank you. Um, wow. The one thing I, I didn't understand with this movie is they don't have a 
conclusion to the film's storyline. I mean, he beats up the people that are chasing after him, but Mm -hmm. they don't actually fully play out the conclusion with Don Stefano's character, who is the kind of overlord mob boss. He didn't get his comeuppance, and I just found that a little odd. Well, that's for the FBI to take care of. I thought they were going to address that in the next movie, right? (laughs) Oh, no. No, no, no. (laughs) That all takes place in a different country. It's very, very Cleopatra Jones. And, like, the first Cleopatra Jones is great. Second one takes place, I think, in Hong Kong. Cleopatra Jones in the Temple of Gold or something. Casino of Gold. And it is not good either. I was about to say, does it take place in an undiscovered country? Because that's probably (laughs) the one I want to go to. No, I, I actually... I read the synopsis for Hot Potato, and it sounds awful. Yeah. I think I remember some elephant riding, maybe. Not too much else. Also, what in God's name is that title? Hot Potato? Yeah. yeah. That, uh, that was one of those titles. Like, Jim Kelly, his movies have so many different titles. Luckily, Black Belt Jones is pretty consistent, but some of his other things, like, I have bought... I think I call it Death Dimension. I think I've bought that like three or four times thinking it was other movies because it would be retitled in different places. And like Golden Needles has another name. There's uh yeah, Hot Potato definitely has a different name, but I can't remember what it was. But he was an interesting person because with Hong Kong films, you know, we would give them different names coming from Hong Kong over here. And the Hong Kong market would give jim kelly movies different names going over there um so that was always a challenge because then i would run across things and i'd be like oh what is this thing and it's you know it's just the same movie that i already own hey that's good right (laughs) that's a nice it's a nice way to spend your money just buying the same movie over and over again oh yeah and then for it to end up being kind of shitty it's like oh okay great (laughs) <laughs> awesome because we're coming up on yeah. my birthday um as it reminds me of this this one movie that my mom is convinced i don't own and she has bought it for me five different times in my lifetime my mom has bought me five copies of beetlejuice on dvd thinking i don't wow i don't own it every time and i'll like open this like like you know gift from my parents and i'll be like Da-da, all this stuff and then there's like a dvd and it's like oh god is it fucking beetlejuice again and I open it and I go, Mom, it's Beetlejuice again. And she goes, I, you, you like that movie? And I was like, yeah, I do like it, but I don't like it enough to own it four times. <laughs> and then the fifth wow. copy. Yeah, so every, before my birthday every year, I'm like, I own Beetlejuice already, just so you know. I would say take a look at other uh, Fred Ro- Weintraub and Robert Klaus films. They were kind of... Uh, those guys and Oscar Williams were kind of a, a team, and so some of them would, would make some interesting things. Like, China O'Brien is kind of interesting, and Jim Cotta is hilarious. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Battle I saw Creek Jim Cotta Brawl. in theaters. Oh, wow. Yep. It was a secret screening at this uh, theater in Cleveland that does uh, midnight movies and Every year at the beginning of the year when they're announcing their calendar for the rest of the year, they you get a f- to go for a free random screening, and it's some, usually something terrible. And yeah, it was Jim Cotta. <laughs> it was pretty great. <laughs> Klaus also directed Battle Creek Brawl, which was supposed to be the introduction of Jackie Chan to America more than the Cannibal Run films already were. And that movie is bizarre. You owe it to yourself to try to track that one down it's way better than the protector which uh was another attempt that jackie made it was a movie with danny aiello what um and speaking of (laughs) italian you don't get much more italian than danny aiello um but yeah battle creek brawl was kind of like i can't remember the plot of it that much but i think it was like getting all of the world's greatest fighters in one place and then having a contest Mortal Kombat, you say and Kind of like an American Mortal Kombat. And I think that there's a different edit of it that they released in Hong Kong. And I can't remember. I think they called it the Big Crawl, the Big Brawl over here and Battle Creek Brawl in Hong Kong. And Battle Creek Brawl, the Hong Kong version, is probably the one you're going to want to watch. But it's, it's kind of an interesting disaster. I will say, though, <laughs> the film by Robert Klaus you should not watch, once again... Game of Death. Don't do it. 
do not yeah. do it. Watch Enter the Dragon and don't no. for, and just forget that Game of Death exists. I notice that that is suspiciously absent from the upcoming Criterion Collection. What Game of Death? Yeah, because they are releasing a whole thing of Bruce Lee movies, but not that it's one. It's barely a movie, and it's definitely not a Bruce Lee movie. <laughs> is his family not uh, happy with that movie? Because I could see that that being a. I mean, they had filmed footage. I mean, they have a lot. They have a lot of the fight scenes in that film with Bruce yeah. Lee. But the problem is, it's like all the fight scenes are Bruce Lee. But you can't just have a movie with just fight scenes. <laughs> you got to have plot and right. Character, de- well, character development in quotations, but... Have you seen The Raid? <laughs> that's, true. that's true. But you know who that's also made by? Deftly aware of what they're making filmmakers, who are just like, let's just true, put a bunch true. of wacky shit on screen, and we know this will work. Uh, Game of Death, on the yeah. other hand, is... Uh, Bruce Lee fights Kam- Kam- Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at one point. That was interesting. Those guys were really good friends which was kind of crazy that they were but you know i mean i'm not um you know thanks to mike my kind of kung fu borders have been expanded i know mike and i you you and i did almost an entire month uh and i think you were on like half of them at least of jackie chan movies i think you may have actually been on all of them uh and we talked about all kinds of jackie chan kung fu movies we did some other movies like game of death which we watched at one point a long time ago But, you know, I also, like Jess said, I'm like, I'm like my Kung Fu genre, similar to black exploitation. it's pretty like a pretty blind spot for me. Like I've seen Jackie Chan movies. More familiar with like Shaw Brothers stuff than like, and even that is few and far between. But I should, uh, you know, maybe we should do a, a Kung Fu month because I wouldn't mind. I've always wanted to, you know, get more fluent in that area of film. Just let's just watch. Legend of the Drunken Master five times, because that movie is fucking amazing. (laughs) Uh, I mean, I remember when you and I did that podcast together, Mike, and I was like, this is one of the greatest films I've ever seen. And I stand by that still to this day. It is a, oh my God, I kind of just want to watch it. But um, Mike, what would you give Black Belt Jones out of five? I would give it a solid three out of five. What about you, Jess? Uh, I'm going to probably give it a two and a half out of five. I'll give it a three. I mean, there are issues. It's entertaining. The soundtrack, we didn't even talk about that, is amazing. The music, oh, like wow. the Black Belt Jones theme is perfect. Uh, I don't think there's... One of the best things about being here in Detroit is that um, Dennis Coffey, who wrote that song and performs that song, he is still around and performs it. Uh, there's a bar downtown that he performs at, and he will do the Black Belt Jones theme sometimes. That's amazing. That's awesome. I thought I thought you were going to say, like, you could pay him to follow you around and do the Black Belt Jones theme while you're walking the streets, because well, that'd be pretty sweet. These days, if he's six feet behind me, sure. But otherwise, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll tell you what, there are a few songs that I listen to that when they come on are as badass as some of the f- songs from black exploitation films. I mean, the intro like to Pusher Man, holy Oh god, I mean, yeah. Holy shit. Like, come on. Like that's classic. I mean, and the Black Belt Jones theme is right up there with some of these greats. I mean, it's it's fantastic. It's a little bit more high energy, it's a little less understated, but it's great. I mean, you know, we can't, you're not going to be able to find a complaint with soundtracks in black exploitation films, that's for sure. So, on that note, let's take a break and we'll play a preview for the final culture cast of Black Exploitation April. Jim Brown. Fred Williamson. Jim Kelly. They do it. Their way. Three the hard way. Three cities and three of us. Three the hard way. You see, we have a scientific institution here. They're gonna kill us all. You gotta stop. Action explodes all over the place when the big three join forces to save their race. Brown. Williamson, Kelly, rated R. That's right. On the final podcast of Black Exploitation April, we're going to be talking about three the hard way 
Fred Williamson, Jim... I was going to say Jim Jones. Yikes. Not Jim Jones. <laughs> not French guy. I promise. Jim Brown and Jim Kelly all together beating up more mobsters or white supremacists. Mob white supremacists. Not, yeah, that sounds Not right. Klansmen, though. Yeah. Or probably Klansmen? No. Until then, you're joining me again, Mike, for that one. And we're going to be joined by uh, Culture Cast First Timer, though I have been on several podcasts with her. We're going to be joined by our good friend, Heather Drain. And uh, if any podcast in the past is any indicator... Somehow Steven Seagal is going to come up, and somehow we're going to talk about Steven Seagal eating corn dogs. So it's just, I think, Mike, it's almost a guarantee at this point. I know you cut it out on your podcast for good reason. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's like, this part's going out of the podcast. It's completely off topic, and I don't want anyone to hear this. I think I actually left it in there, but... <laughs> well, I think, we, I think every time we've, I've been on your podcast with Heather, we've somehow managed to get on a Steven Seagal. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, so until then, uh, where can people find you, Jess? You can find me on Twitter at writer Jess Byard. And uh, if you want to hear me talking about TV with Chris, you can catch us over at the One Season Show, where we talk about television shows that lasted only one season. Uh, and if you want to hear us talk about some spooky stuff, you can see us over at uh, Scary Stories We Tell, where we're talking about Unsolved Mysteries, Unexplained Phenomenon, True Crime, and Horror Culture. Check us out there. What about you, Mike? Um, you can hear me at The Projection Booth, which I do every week at projectionboothpodcast.com. And as for myself, Twitter is where you'll find me, Casualty underscore Chris. I talk about the podcast that I'm on there, at CultureCast on Twitter. CultureCast.com is where you can find the rest of the episodes of this show. We've been doing this now for six years, coming up on six years this October. So there's a lot of episodes. Patreon.com slash CultureCast is where you can go to kick a couple dollars our way. Uh, big thanks to all of our patrons. The music for the CultureCast is Tiger Blood Jewels, The Bayou. And we'll catch you on the next episode.